السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and bless every single one of us. My brothers and sisters, we are going through the reasons of revelation of verses of the noble Quran. We will commence this evening with verse number 88 of Surah An-Nisa. We all know the battle of Uhud took place. And at the beginning, when the Muslimin were going out to the battle, they were quite a few in number. Some of them decided to pull back and to come back when they thought that perhaps the Muslimin will lose because the entire army of the Meccans was coming all the way to Uhud. So more than 300 or 300 plus happened to come back to Medina to Munawwara. And there is a hadith muttafaq alayhi, narrated by Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu an. He says that on that day when those hypocrites came back and after the battle of Uhud, there was a debate among the believers. The debate was those who went back, they are hypocrites. Should we fight them or should we leave them? So the debate became very, very strong. One group from among the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were saying, let's fight them. They are hypocrites. They're going to be a rot in our midst. And the other group said, no, we cannot fight them because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has expressly said that we should not be killing those who are hypocrites because the people would then say that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is killing his companions. So verses were revealed to explain something very, very serious. And that was the fight that you are having between yourselves as to whether these people are hypocrites or not is more dangerous than anything else. Many times what happens among the Muslims, we have a debate amongst ourselves regarding something external, something outside. And that happens to split us in a way that is more detrimental against us than anything else. So we need to learn to understand that as an ummah, our strength is in our unity. Allah says clearly, Do not debate, do not dispute with one another, because you will be unsuccessful and you will lose your strength. So verses were revealed explaining this. What is it with you that you are divided regarding the hypocrites? Yet Allah is the one who chased them away because of what they had earned. Allah is the one who kept them away from the battle of Uhud. The battle of Uhud, we all know that it ended without a decisive victory. But if we were to look at it, the Muslimin were not defeated. The Kuffar were not defeated. It was only a lesson for the Mu'mineen. The lesson was whoever disobeys Allah and his Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they will not be able to see clean cut victory. As simple as that. Those who were the archers on the hillock who decided to come down against the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, perhaps it would be correct for us to say that that resulted in a greater loss. But there was no clean defeat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the debate and the argument amongst ourselves regarding petty matters, petty issues. Allah says in the next verse, Allah says in the next verse, وَدُّوا لَوْ تَكْفُرُونَ كَمَا كَفَرُوا فَتَكُونُونَ سَوَاءً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, They wish that you disbelieve just like they disbelieved, so that the two of you can be equal. So that the two of you can be equal. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear that the hypocrites, their intention is to divide us. Their intention is for us to join their ranks. And this will be their mission all the time. Verse number 92 of Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of an incident that occurred with Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'ah. There was a man in Makkah al-Mukarrama known as Al-Harith ibn Yazid, him and Abu Jahl. They harmed Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'ah a lot when he was in Makkah al-Mukarrama. 
And so Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'ah, he came to Medina Munawwara, the Hijra, and later on, Al Harith ibn Yazid decided that he also has turned to the fold of Islam and he wants to make the Hijra. So he started the soul journey of the Hijra, and Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'ah happened to see him outside Medina. And he remembered, this is the man who used to beat me up. He almost killed me. He wanted to kill me and he didn't succeed. This narration is made mention of by At-Tabari in his tafsir. And so he went to him because now the two of them were alone. And he got hold of him. And this Al-Harith says, look, I've become a Muslim and I would like to make the Hijrah. But sadly, Ayyash ibn Abi Rabi'ah executed him. The reason is, it was a tit for tat. This man tried to kill me a long time back. He almost got me killed. Had I not gone, perhaps it would have happened. So when the fight happened, this one died. Al-Harith ibn Yazid died. And thereafter, the, the message came to the Prophet sallallahu with revelation. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ أَن يَقْتُلَ مُؤْمِنًا إِلَّا خَطَأً The ruling regarding the killing of a believer. You are not allowed to kill a believer. A believer is never ever allowed to kill another believer. If that happens, the, the one who is the murderer will enter the fire of hell. And Allah says, Khalidan fiha. Allah says he will be there for a long, long time. The term Khalidan fiha refers to two things. It can either refer to forever or it can refer to for a long, long time. In this instance, for a long, long time. And Allah says, وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا Allah becomes angry with the person and curses him and for him is a severe punishment because life was given by Allah. Allah is the giver of life. Who are you to take the life of another believer away? Today, people are using the name of Islam to execute other Muslims just because they have a dispute or difference of opinion and so on. May Allah protect us. If we take a careful look at this, it is a sickness and a disease. Allah says, believer, never ever. You've got no right whatsoever. Not only the believers, even other innocent people, you're not allowed to just harm them for no purpose, no reason. We are mu'mineen. Our aim on this earth is to try and spread iman so that it can get to those who are disbelievers so that they can enter the fold of Islam. This was the mission even of those of our pious predecessors who worked so hard, perhaps on our forefathers in a way that today we are Muslimin sitting and listening to this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So Allah explains subhanahu wa ta'ala that if a believer kills someone else, it can only be by mistake. It cannot be intentional. Can it never be purposely? So if it was a mistake, if it was an error, then there is a way to resolve the matter. And that entire explanation is given in these beautiful verses of the Quran, verse number 93, 94. Uh, inshallah, I hope we can go through verse number 93 at leisure, inshallah, in our own time. And we will be able to see, in fact, it's verse number 92 of Surah An-Nisa. We will be able to see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has resolved this and how the solution is when a mistake happens. And for your information to this day, if people happen to be killed in an accident, in a car accident, there is a way of resolving the matter. Because the man who was driving or the person whose fault it was, is responsible. I think they call it culpable homicide, right? So they are responsible for what? For what has happened? It was their fault, their mistake, but it was an accident. So perhaps they will not be penalized to the highest of degrees, but they need to pay for it. They need to acknowledge it. They may be forgiven by those who lost their limbs or their lives, the heirs of them, or they may not be forgiven, in which case they will have to pay what is known as a dia. A dia, sometimes referred to as blood money and sometimes referred to as a settlement. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand it is something very serious. And this is why uh, when people die in accidents, it is definitely those who are responsible. They need to stand up and acknowledge that yes, it was an accident, but it was our fault. We could have done better. We could have perhaps driven slowly. We could have perhaps ensured that our vehicle was okay and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us on our roads. Really, they are becoming more and more dangerous throughout the globe. I think perhaps because of the vehicles becoming so fast. I always wonder why is it that the speed limit sit at 120 when the vehicle shows you 240? Perhaps it's just a carrot that's dangling. And you know what? Some of us become donkeys sometimes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us.
Mashallah. Brothers and sisters, verse number 93. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains, I've already spoken about it, that if a person kills another intentionally, then for them Allah becomes angry with them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses them and for them is a severe punishment. There is a story made mention by Ikrimah in Tafsir al-Tabari. He says there was a man from the Ansar and he killed a man who was the brother of someone known as Miqyas. And this Miqyas, the Prophet sallallahu spoke to him and told him, look, you are the heir. Do you agree on a settlement? He agreed on a settlement, the blood money. So it was given to him. That means, okay, it's resolved. I don't want now the blood of this person. But after having taken this amount, he took the law into his own hands after a while and he still killed the murderer. He still took the law in his own hands and killed the murderer. Now for your information, this vigilantism is haram in Islam. If someone has done bad to you, you need to report him to authority. You are not in Islam allowed to take the law into your own hands. Otherwise, you will face the full wrath of the same law. So the Prophet ﷺ then said that we will have to execute Miqyas because of what he did. Yes, he did execute a murderer, but he took the law into his own hands and it was after the settlement had happened. So this is something very, very strong in terms of a message to us. As Muslimin, we sometimes become frustrated with certain things that might be happening. It does not mean you take the law into your own hands and you go and beat somebody up, you go and hit them, you go and murder them. This is unacceptable in Islam. Here we are, reasons of revelation of this verse have explained the prohibition of vigilantism. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. Verse number 94 of Surah An-Nisa, another incident where someone was murdered. Who was murdered? This time there was a man from Banu Sulaim. Let's listen very carefully because we are affected by this. A man, shepherd from Banu Sulaim, he was out in the field in one of the farms in the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. And he was with his sheep, a group of Muslims who were sent by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a platoon happened to pass him. They saw this man and he said to them, Assalamu Alaikum, aloud. And sadly, shaitan made these people think for a moment that this man is saying assalamu alaikum because he has something to hide. He's not a believer. He's actually fearing that we might harm him or attack him. And he's being hypocritical. They attacked him. A'udhu billah. They murdered him. They took all his sheep and they went away. That was something very bad. They judged the man. He said assalamu alaikum. They said, no, no, he's not a Muslim. He's not a Muslim. And so they harmed him, attacked him, like we said, killed him off. He was a man from Banu Sulaim. The story went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is made mention of in Sahih al-Bukhari by Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, as well as in Sunan al-Tirmidhi. Meaning the story went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and verses were revealed. Powerful, powerful verses. Verse number 94. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu O you who believe And I'm sure all of us consider ourselves believers So let's listen Iza darabtum fi sabilillahi fatabayyanu When you are traveling In the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala When you are traveling on earth The cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Verify thoroughly Before passing judgment on someone Verify thoroughly before passing judgment on someone. وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ أَلْقَى إِلَيْكُمُ السَّلَامَ لَسْتَ مُؤْمِنًا Never ever say to someone who has said Assalamu alaikum to you that you are not a believer. Amazing. Clear cut verse. Someone says Assalamu alaikum and you presume this person is not a Muslim. Your first presumption is if there is one sign of Iman or Islam in a person, for you it's enough. What's in the heart is in Allah's hands. Yes, if you definitely know because you were close to the person and so on that they are just saying assalamu alaikum because they happen to be knowing the Islamic greeting, then you reply to them, wa alaikum salam even if they are not Muslim. If a non-Muslim greets you with assalamu alaikum and you are clearly sure that they said assalamu alaikum properly and they did not say assalamu alaikum, they had no evil intention, then you respond the greeting with a similar greeting or better than it. The only time you say wa 
alaykum is when you're not sure what they've said. When, when you don't know exactly what they've said, they might have been very malicious in their intention. Like at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they were the hypocrites. They said to Muhammad ﷺ, As-salamu alaykum. As-salamu alaykum without the la in the middle. You know, normally we say as-salah. This is as sa So as-salamu alaykum means death upon you. So they used to say, As-salamu alaykum. So Aisha radiallahu anha heard it. And you know, immediately she retaliated. She said, Wa alaykum as-salamu wal-la'na. She said, upon you is not only death, but even the curse of Allah. So the Prophet sallallahu says, Mahlan ya Aisha. Relax, O oh Aisha, take it easy. If they greet you with As-salamu alaykum, you just say, Wa alaykum. You just say, and to you too. So no matter what they've said to you, you said, and to you too. So they say death to you, it means yes, and you too. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. But if you know that they have said peace be upon you, the Quran says, وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَسِيبًا when someone has greeted you, when you are greeted with a greeting, respond with a better greeting or at least equate it. So it falls into that particular category. May Allah grant us an understanding. So today we have a sickness of calling people kafir. Not only does the person say assalamu alaikum, we see him reading salah, we hear the shahada from his tongue, we see him recite la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And because we have a difference of opinion with him, we say this man is a kafir. That's it. And Allah is saying, the salam is enough not to call him a kafir. Imagine, don't say it. So let's be careful. This is why I always say, those who know the Quran thoroughly, they cannot be fooled. They know what Allah's instructions are. They become softened. They learn to love one another. They are so loving in their hearts that they reach out to the non-Muslims with such dedication that they desperately want to see the non-Muslims enter into the fold of Islam. That's the heart of a true mu'min. That was the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He desperately wanted to see Abu Jahl and Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraiq and all the others enter into the fold of Islam. That is why he lent them an ear. That is why he spoke to them with so much of respect. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand that our mission on earth is not to kill off everybody we see who's different with us or from us, but rather to reach out to them, to be able to teach them what is right, to be able to convince them that what we have is actually the right path and you are missing out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. When you have a bargain and you try and tell someone, you know what brother, sister, there is a bargain out there. They might not listen to you. But when you show them, look, this is the deal I got. And I only got this entire dinner set for 50 rands. And it's original. Notice I'm using dinner set because then the men also have to think how to please their women. Mashallah. <laughs> and then they will start thinking, okay, where did you get it from? It's very easy. You press a button and they'll deliver it home. Wow. They'll press 10 buttons, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us market the deen in a beautiful way so that the Muslimin can be strengthened and those who are not Muslim can look into the fold of Islam. And may Allah grant them hidayah and guidance. Ameen. Brothers and sisters, another beautiful verse. We all know that Islam gives great importance to those who are challenged, those who are disabled, those who perhaps might not be uh, exactly like everyone else in terms of their vision, in terms of their ability. Some might call them disabled, some call them challenged. Islam gives great preference and priority to such people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept rules and regulations in their regard, such that if they are not able to read salah, say standing, they can sit and read. If they cannot see, they have a certain excuses or that they have uh, a leeway from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So verses of jihad that were revealed and amazingly these verses are so strong because at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam there were occasions when people were conscripted. So anyone who stayed behind was considered a criminal because everyone was conscripted. So there were some people who couldn't make it because of their disability or inability. So according to a hadith muttafaq alayhi reported by Al-Bara ibn Azib radiallahu anhu. He says, a certain verse was revealed regarding jihad. And Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam called Zayd ibn Thabit. He used to write. He says, I'm dictating to you, write the following. What was the verse? Verse number 95 of Surah An-Nisa. La yastawi al-qa'iduna min al-mu'mineen wal mujahiduna fi sabilillah. The verse is, those who are sitting behind 
from among the believers and those who have gone out to struggle in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are not equal. Who are not equal? Those who stayed behind and those who went out. The two of them are not equal. So behind the Prophet ﷺ was the blind man standing. What was his name? Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum radiyallahu an. He was the mu'addin of Rasulullah Wasallam with Bilal ibn Rabah radiyallahu an. He says, O oh Messenger, I am darir. You know, I am disabled. I cannot see. So verses were revealed in the middle of that verse. The term or the words غَيْرُ أُولِ الضَّرَرِ were added on through revelation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uniquely waited for this man to say the words before these words were revealed. Had he wanted, he could have revealed them without these words. But Allah wanted to show us that there is a story behind the revelation so that we can remember the term غَيْرُ أُولِ الضَّرَرِ which means the exception of those who are disabled. Allahu Akbar. So now when we read the verse, do you know how we read it? لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين غير أولي الضرر والمجاهدون في سبيل الله Amazing, amazing. So it's added in the center of the verse. So now Allah says they are not equal those who sit behind and those who sit behind and those who go forth except the disabled who are granted an excuse. Amazing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand the beauty of this Quran. Verse number 100 of Surah An-Nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who intend to do good and do not complete the good. Say for example, I want to fulfill my Salatul Tahajjud and I've set my clock and everything happens. And for some reason, I didn't manage to get up. Not because I snoozed the clock and snoozed the clock. We always say if you snooze, you lose. MashaAllah. <laughs> If you snooze, you lose. Don't press snooze. A mu'min should not have a snooze button on their phone or on their clock. You want to get up for salah, there's no snoozing. That snooze is shaitan. Remember this. So if you want to get up and for some reason you overslept, something happened, maybe you fell ill. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the reward because innamal a'malu bin niyat. The hadith says all your actions will be judged by the underlying intentions. So those who intended to make hijrah and they started the hijrah, but they died halfway. They died somewhere. They died just as they set out the journey. Allah writes for them the hijrah as though they had made it. Subhanallah. Did you know this? So there was a man at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu This hadith is narrated by Ibn Abi Hatim uh, reporting from Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. He says there were those people who passed away on the path from Mecca to Medina. Some names are mentioned at Dumari and uh, certain names, but there is a difference of opinion regarding the names and whether it was just one person or a few and so on. So we won't mention the names, but the verse is, وَمَن يَخْرُجْ مِن بَيْتِهِ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ يُدْرِكْهُ الْمَوْتُ فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ Whoever has come out of his house, doing the hijrah for the sake of Allah and his messenger, and then he passes away on the path, then his reward is definitely written with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless us. Look at the mercy of Allah. A mu'min and a believer receives a reward based on his intention. And this is why when you are doing a good deed with a false intention, it becomes sinful. May Allah forgive us. A person wants to reach out to others with money in order to show off. It becomes a show off and it does not become an act of worship. But if people happen to see you donate or your reason for letting others know how much you are donating is because you would like to encourage them to give too, then there is no harm. There is nothing wrong. In fact, then it's a good deed. So sometimes you have people who say, right, this man has given so much. How much are you giving? It happened even at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu that was not in order to boast. It was in order to encourage others that look, if such a man can give and he's only a millionaire, what are you going to give when you are a billionaire? <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand. Amen, amen. Then we have verse number 101, a beautiful verse, another discount from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, people who go on business, they're always looking for discounts. They phone and they say, you know what? Hey, we're going to China. Now, are we allowed to leave our fast for after Ramadan. So the first question, it's just a business trip. It's not any religious trip. It's a business trip. But guess what? You still enjoy the discounts. Do you know that? MashaAllah. Even though it's a business trip, you did it in the month of Ramadan, you still enjoy the discount. If you're a Musafir, you have the discount of a Musafir, even though the journey was for business. It was not a haram journey. 
permissible. Some people say, you know what, I'm traveling. Friday morning, first thing, I have to go. I might miss my Jumu'ah. The reality is if you have to go on the Friday, you have to go on the Friday. I had recently a person who told me that I have a ridiculously priced ticket overseas, but it, it's on a Friday morning. Can I travel? The reality is if you have to travel, you have to travel. You will now be known as a Musafir. If you get an opportunity to read your Jumu'ah, you may do so. But for your information, what is compulsory upon you as a Musafir is the Dhuhr. You need to know this. It is a discount from Allah. Because one of the conditions of the obligation of Jumu'ah is that you are not a Musafir. You are not a traveler. If you are a traveler, it becomes optional. So you can, you have an option of making your dhuhr or you have an option if you can to join the Jumu'ah. But I think the bulk of us would agree that we try our best to still look for the Jumu'ah and read it even though we may be Musafir because we know the value of that Jumu'ah. But just for your information, the discount does apply. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains. When these businessmen came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and they said, you know, we travel a lot. So how should we read our salah? Allahu Akbar. It's like they were searching for discount, even in salah. As it is the business people search for the discount in trade, isn't it? So verses were revealed. 101 of Surah An-Nisa. وَإِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَقْصُرُوا مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ When you are traveling on the land, you are a traveler, there is no harm if you would cut your salah. So we know it as salatul qasr. Taqsuru min as salah. Salatul qasr means that salah which is cut down. So from four it becomes two. But the three remains and the two remains. Only the four becomes two. Your dhuhr, your asr becomes two, two. Your isha becomes two. Discount. And that which is sunnah, obviously the farad would remain farad. That which is lesser than farad would remain lesser than farad. So after some time, it is reported that almost a month later, and this narration is also reported by Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu in tafsir al-Tabari. After some time, the verse was ended. In khiftum an yaftinakum alladheena kafaru. If you fear that the disbelievers might harm you, they might test you, they might hurt you, they might want to attack you, then you shorten your salah. So now, some of the Mufassireen and some of the scholars happen to say that this verse is teaching us Salatul Khawf. It is a different type of Salah that you read when you are in fear. At the time of a war, say the enemy is in front of us, how to read Salah? Because the term in khiftum is there. Allah says when you are scared, when you are fearing the enemy or the disbelievers. And some of the scholars say no, it is connected to the shortening on a journey, whether you are scared or not. So some say it's for both and some say it's only for Salatul Khawf. That is just a discussion among the scholars. But the more interesting point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored the ummah by showing them different methods of fulfilling Salah on different occasions. When you're a traveler, you read Salah slightly differently in terms of quantity. When you are uh, in war, for example, you read Salah slightly differently in terms of quality. Amazing. This is something amazing and this is why in the next verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the entire method of reading Salatul Khawf do you know what he says this is something that is mentioned in Sunan uh, in fact in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim as well as Musnad al-Imam Ahmad narrated by Abi Ayyash radiallahu an he says we were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a place known as Asfan or Usfan and we met the army met the mushrikeen in front of us and from among them was Khalid ibn al-Walid. We saw him in the midst of the mushriks and we had to read Salat al-Dhuhr. So we got up and we fulfilled Salat al-Dhuhr in Jama'ah. Everyone went in sujood, everyone came up, we read our Salah. So Khalid ibn al-Walid tells his people, do you know what? We should have attacked them while they were oblivious. They all went into sajda. At that moment, if we whacked them, we could have knocked all of them. Literally, that's what, what he said. They were all in sajda. Who was looking after them? We could have swiped. They were all gone one time. So then Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu said, wait, hang on. There is another prayer that they love more than themselves and their children. It's coming just now. What prayer was that? Salatul Asr. Stop for a moment. Khalid ibn al-Walid being a disbeliever is acknowledging that these Muslims love Salatul Asr more than they love themselves and their children. How many of us love Salah? more than we love ourselves. We don't even want to fulfill it. We don't even, if our children come in front of us, that's it, we are melted. Ooh, 
my darling, and Salah is gone. <laughs> Wallahi, that's what happens. We are melted, our family members come and that's it. In fact, a haram relationship. You are talking to someone you're not supposed to be speaking to. And Allah is, by the way, the adhan goes, Hayya al-falah. And we are just speaking here. This is unsuccessful. Your call is unsuccessful. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Learn from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. All of us, myself included, we have a page to take. The kuffar are acknowledging that these mu'mineen love Salatul Asr more than they love themselves. It's impossible for them to miss it. They are at war, but they're still going to read their salah. So he says, when they read that salah, we will wipe them out. And they did not know that Jibreel alayhi salam came with verses to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, teaching him the method of Salatul Khawf. So I won't read for you the verses, but verse number 102 of Surah An-Nisa, where Allah describes the whole of Salatul Khawf. It's quite a long verse. And Allah says, when you stand up in Salah at this time of war, then you stand up with those behind you holding their armor, holding their weapons, and you make two rows, two groups of people. When the one group goes for sajda with you, the other must stand and watch. And then when that one comes up, this one must go down. That one must stand and watch. Then when that one comes and they will rotate. Amazing. So when they started Salatul Asr, these disbelievers were ready, waiting. They were waiting. They held their armor and all that. And then when the Prophet ﷺ says, Allahu Akbar, and he went into sajda, one group was standing with their weapon. <laughs> Salah changed. Amazing. This is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Khalid ibn al-Walid, now let's fast forward. Later on, he became a Muslim. You know what he said later on? He said, I always knew this man was the truth. He spoke the truth. He was protected by Allah. Ar-rajulu mamnu'. I told myself, this man, it's impossible to get to him. And he says, one of the incidents where I was confident we were going to wipe them out was this incident. And Allah had revealed Salatul Khawf. And I was shocked. We were gobsmacked. Subhanallah. They didn't know what to say. This is the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says at the end, When you are at peace once again, and you are calm, then you fulfill salah the proper way once again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand His blessings upon us. He has made salah so easy. We still feel lazy to fulfill salah. Brothers and sisters, I end today's session with a call for myself and yourselves. Let us promise Allah we will never miss the farad salah at least five times a day. Until we meet. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdihi subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.